perhaps even upgrading. Now, but to better help us understand some of the questions that we should be asking, some of the things really that we should be looking out for before we sign that offer to purchase, I'm joined by Grant Smear, who is the director at Epic South Africa. Grant, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. Uh, thanks for having me, Zoma. So I think, Grant, I mean, let's probably just go right into it, right? I mean, so many people are very likely looking into buying, uh, you know, into a new development. That whole, uh, I think, to many, probably one of the things that appeals to them is moving into a brand new place. I know some of the developments even offer, you know, some of the kitchen uh, accessories. So you really want to move into a place that nobody else has, you know, lived in. And there's just something about that, right? But what are some of the things that we should be looking out for? Some of the questions we should be asking, whether it's the sales rep or the developer who's selling us that property before we sign that offer to purchase. Yeah, so um, yeah, obviously new developments are, are very marketed very well. They're packaged beautifully and, and you sort of go along to these um, places that are landscaped and look amazing and it really feels like home. Um, and, and first and foremost, you should be looking at the developer's um, uh, reputation and their history. How much have they developed? What have they developed in the past? Have there been any issues with the developments? Um, you know, so, so I think first and foremost, we need to consider the, the developer and, and their experience, um, whether it's uh, the developer themselves or the, um, the bigger de development team, what their experience is and what they've actually produced. And I think Grant, you know, where are some of the, how would we actually find out some of those, that some of that information? Because I think if you look at certain markets, certainly, for example, in the Gauteng region, you'd find that there's so many developments that are popping up, so many different names that you can see um, on the various boards that some people might not know some of the more household names in terms of the developers. Perhaps some are more familiar than others, but certainly not every developer um, is a household name. So how do we then kind of fact check whether this would be somebody's you know, first development or they've kind of been in the game for a number of years or perhaps even have multiple uh, projects running in different parts of the country? So, so first of all, I mean, you've got a sales agent on the ground that should know the ins and outs of the development itself as well as the developer um, and the development teams, the professional team that's, that's involved. So asking the questions there, uh, which developments, uh, how many units, uh, where have they developed in the past? And then um, making use of our friend Google to just get online and jump and check out the developer and see if there's any uh, feedback or reviews or comments or anything that's popped up uh, online about the development that they've had. Um, an example is, is I know in, again in Gauteng, there have been several developers where developments have popped up, like you say, and there's actually been a massive issue with damp and the, um, a lot of the developments haven't had their damp, pro, uh, damp proof coursing put in place properly. Um, that, that uh, issue has then followed a couple of developers around because it's something that they do as a matter of course is, is they don't invest in the properties and make sure that, they, for example, the damp uh, doesn't cause an issue later on. So you can uh, sort of check with the sales agent first and foremost, and then just jump on Google and check them out. And I think, you know, we'll get to some of the, the, the questions that you should probably ask um, when it's now at the post-sale aspect, because I think yeah. there are so many issues that could come up post the sale and you know you've already highlighted one damp does become such a huge issue I mean, i've heard horror stories of people who've bought into new developments and and then it starts raining because perhaps they probably you know bought in the winter then comes spring and summer it starts raining and they have a massive damp issue um and when they follow up with the developer the developer is nowhere to be found they said you know they've had it over the unit and there's nothing that they can really do and you when you kind of search around you ask around you, you get a sense that that developer tends to have that more often than not. Um, and typically, you know, some of the consumers probably didn't know about it. So we'll, we'll look a little bit about some of the processes um, that perhaps you could ask about when it's now post-sale and you find certain snags in the, um, in the particular property. And then what are some of the issues in, that you, you, you should be looking out for when you're buying a new development? Because I think oftentimes, um, you know, developers sell at different stages. Sometimes it's a brand new development. Uh, they haven't even broken ground. How would you then know that this is the, the type of property I should even be going for? They don't even have a unit that's ready, um, you know, to display it because they haven't built it. Um, and perhaps in the next few months, then they'll have that unit up and ready so you can get a sense, a physical sense of how it's going to look like. But before that, you're literally just looking at a drawing, you're looking at, you know, there are mock-ups and you're already signing that this is something that you want to uh, buy. And I think they even, you, you put in like a 20,000 or 30,000 rand 
um, deposit once you've like signed. What should we be looking out for at that stage when it's just buying off plan? There isn't even, they haven't even broken ground at that stage. Yeah, so I mean, if you're buying off plan, firstly, uh, the risk that you're taking is nature of that transaction. So you are taking quite a substantial risk and therefore are getting property at a discounted rate compared to, for example, a property that's been built and the developer's shown proof of concept has sold some units. And, and that's why phase one is usually cheaper than phase two and phase three. I mean, that's just the nature of the game. Um, so for, go back to my point, um, uh, reputation of the developer is vitally important. So looking into the developer first, first and foremost. Um, secondly, when you are um, going to sit down and sign that OTP, don't allow emotion to take control. So those sales agents that developers are trained to make sure that you get there, you get all excited about the property, they'll show you 3D rendering, 3D models, show you the small little architectural model, and you get so excited about being able to visualize and see the units you're going to live in that you immediately sign that OTP. I would suggest that you go down to the, to, to the site, take a look around the site, make sure that it's viable firstly from your perspective in terms of location, where, where it is, the services, and then um, take the, the offer to purchase and go to your conveyancing attorney and ask them to go through it. There are a lot of issues in development um, offer to purchases that tie you into that deal regardless of how things progress down the line. And one of those examples is um, an issues that you have is the development starts, but then they miss their deadlines. So they say, well, you're going to have occupation the 1st of March, 2021. And 1st of March, 2021 comes and half of the first block is built and maybe the gatehouse. So you need to be able to get out of that contract if they haven't hit those timelines. And often that clause is missing. And I think, you know, that was actually one of the, 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 the questions I wanted to ask was around, you know, timelines. So in the event where perhaps you're talking to the developer and, have, and you're asking them even about some of their past developments, perhaps one of the questions that you should be asking is, do they need some of the various deadlines um, of the different phases as they are building? Because that would also essentially indicate to you with this particular development that, look, we... We've done this before, firstly, and secondly, we're able to meet our deadlines. So you don't find yourself in a situation where you, you know, you anticipated occupation at a particular date, and then the unit um, isn't ready, uh, and you have all these different, you know, sort of excuses from the particular development. Now, Grant, is the issue of finances something that we should be asking the developer? You know, should we be asking them for their financials uh, just to make sure that you know they've got the money? Should we be asking whether they are bankrupt or have been bankrupt before? Because I mean, there's so many horror stories that we tend to you know hear about halfway through a development, a developer runs out of money, they can't finish it, and you've now bought into it, or perhaps you moved in at phase one, and this is meant to be like five different phases, and they're only halfway through phase three, and they run out of money, and no matter how much they try to kind of sell, they're still not selling so should we asking about them should we be asking them rather about the the nature of their finances yeah i, I mean you know you should and i, I doubt you're going to see the financials of a developer i don't think they'll provide that to you but it's certainly something that uh, you know people need to understand that going into development developers particularly in sectional title schemes one of the biggest issues is um uh the finance of that project it's very difficult they they, they have to do 70 percent pre-sales to be able to uh, activate any any finance usually, um, and once they activate that finance and they start building. So I would say, if you're gonna go into this space, again, it's nature of the game is that you're gonna, if you're gonna buy into a buy off plan or buy into a new development, you are putting that 10 or 20,000 Rand at risk for the potential upside benefit of buying early into, into the development. So discuss the finances with the developer as much as possible, try and get an indication. If you feel anything's off, make sure that you maybe take a step back and wait a little bit. Part two is don't commit too much money. So if they need a 10,000 in deposit, don't commit a 100,000 in deposit, you know, to try and secure the best units. Still commit the 10,000 in units um, because, you know, then you only stand to lose 10,000 rand and then make sure the agreement is in place to, again, we talk about timelines. Once the developer starts missing timelines, you, what you've got to understand is that the carrying costs of an empty development, um, the labor, uh, the, the, the site itself, the finance costs are huge. So the more the development's delayed, the more at risk the developer is from a financial perspective and therefore at risk your money is. So we were saying earlier, you know, you keep an eye on them hitting their timelines, go down and visit the site, make sure that you're very clear that block number one was meant to be built by the 1st of April, block number two by the, by the 1st of May. Make sure that's actually happening. The more they miss those timelines, the longer they're carrying that building and the costs for, the, the more the expenses are going up and therefore 
the more at risk they are financially. So you've got to be on top of it as much as possible, particularly with um, newer developers that you maybe don't know or don't have a history. Guys like, for example, Ball, when we speak about Ball, because they're the biggest in the, in the country, you know, you know those guys are firstly good for the money. Um, they, they build very quickly. They're very good on their timelines. So you can actually literally almost probably peg it to within a week and um, that they actually develop things. Part two is, is there are situations that, that happen that can't, uh, developer can't control. Lockdown, as an example. So do be aware that you might have a clause um, in your agreement that allows a renegotiation of those timeframes. Um, but make sure you've got something in that in the agreement that allows you to exit if they don't meet those those um, projected timelines. If you're joining us at home, I'm speaking to Grant Smear, who's the director of Epic South Africa, and we're talking about some of the questions you should be asking before buying into a new development. If you have any questions about buying into a new development, perhaps you are looking uh, on privateproperty.co.za and you're still undecided whether you should go for a new development or perhaps just buy into a complex that's already been running for a couple of years, do send through those questions. We're going to go for a quick break, and after this, we'll be taking some of your questions and really looking at some of the other issues that we should be mindful of before we buy into a new development. We'll be back just after this. Welcome back to episode 26 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zaman Dunga Kumala. Tonight, I'm joined by Grant Smear, who's the director of Epic South Africa. We're talking about some of the questions you should be asking before buying into a new development. And of course, if you've got any questions on buying into a new development, Perhaps you're a bit, you know, uncertain about whether to buy into a new development or maybe just go for a complex or an estate that's already established. Do send in those questions. Uh, Grant, we've already got a question coming in from Nuntlan Tlangdabeni uh, who asks, why are the last phases so expensive? So, I mean, uh, like I said earlier, um, buying into a development off plan in particular and that first phase is usually the most risky. Also, the developer tries to incentivize those first buyers to really get to that 70 percent um, pre-sale so what they'll do they'll divide the section the sections or the phases and phase one they'll need to to develop um, and get the finance on so they'll try and get 70 percent pre-sales use some of the profits and then finance phase two facing and carry on so really it's about uh, two things is proof of concept um buy confidence so buy confidence getting people in and once that phase one is built they can show firstly they're established they've developed and um therefore people pay uh, phase two phase three uh, more because there's less risk to the to the buyer or to the, uh, to the, uh, yeah, to the buyer, sorry. And, you know, so Grant, I mean, I've seen a lot of different developments, especially here in Gauteng. Uh, if, if, if anything, I mean, we've got quite a lot of uh, excess stock where some of the developers, for example, are even offering uh, free levies for a year. Um, yeah. and, and I suppose it's a way to entice buyers to, to buy in. But I think for many of us who are able to see the other side, it's also developers who are struggling to sell some of that stock. Should people kind of trip carefully with some of those developments where they are struggling to sell um, you know, some of their units or should we just take it as we're in a market where there is quite a lot of, a lot of excess stock and it isn't necessarily a sign of a bad development, but perhaps just the market that we find ourselves in, particularly in the Gauteng region? Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's, it's an interesting one because um, yeah, any property, so we can take new developments, existing stock, anything, there's always a price point for it. So a property will always sell at a price. Um, so if it's being sold at the right price, there's always a market for it. So if a developer is struggling to sell, my, my first, first question is, 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 it, is it poorly developed or is it poor development or is it priced too high? So yeah, I mean, if you are comfortable getting in at a certain level, so should a lot of other people in the market. 
if there is a hundred unit development and they're struggling to sell 30 of their units, I would, I would potentially question um, why those units are sitting available. If we're in a difficult market right now, even if they drop that price 100, 200,000, they'll be able to sell all 30. So there's always a price point that a property will sell. So regardless of the market, of the nature of the market. So I don't think that's necessarily something. So yeah, uh, you, you're exactly right. If somebody is struggling to sell the stock, I'd be quite cautious of getting into that space. And I think it's something that's probably a lot of people in Gauteng uh, are mindful of. I and mean, I'm not so familiar with other parts. I certainly see it uh, here in Gauteng. You're driving around and you see big boards with, you know, get first 12 months off of levies, which I suppose seems enticing when you consider how sometimes levies can go up to 2,000, 3,000, sometimes even more. But the upside could, as you're saying, that there could actually be something that might be suspect beyond it being um, just excess stock for the sake of excess stock. Um, and I think perhaps then that brings us to the issue of negotiating prices. I mean, oftentimes we, a lot of people who want to buy into new developments um, have an issue with the price, right? Because oftentimes in property, we know that the, the price that's advertised isn't necessarily the price that you're going to pay. You're able to negotiate, sometimes get five, 10, even more percent, less than the, the purchase price that was advertised. And yet we tend to not see that being the case with developments. How do we go about negotiating a lower price in these new developments? Particularly because a lot of times the developer has already sort of priced in their price point as they're um, as they're doing their own financials and 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 building essentially. So how do we go about negotiating and trying to get a, a lower price than what they've advertised to us? So, so I mean, the first thing is to just understand what, what the the reason why you're buying into a complex or, or why you're buying into development. Um, you know, if you feel that there's a good developer and he's uh, he's good, creating good stock, he's come with a great product in a great area, you could potentially see upside um, benefit by buying in early and then seeing some capital growth there and benefiting out of that. So you might not want to negotiate a, a discount, but just get in as early as possible and also buy the best possible units uh, from a location point of view within the complex. Part two is if you're really looking to then um, negotiate a discount, I would take a look at a few things, is how many developments are going with North as, a, as an example and, and towards Lanzaria. That entire space along Bitcorp and uh, Northumberland has got three or four big developers throwing lots and lots of units up. So they're literally competing as hundreds of units all at, the, all at the same time, they're competing for the same market. So you've got definite potential there to negotiate prices on the complex that you choose because there's so much stock on the market. And that's a case where, where the developers are going to be struggling to sell everything because there's so much um, out there, so much supply at the moment. So first thing is supply and demand in an area, um, how much stock's in the market. Part two is how many units are you buying? Um, I know we, I mentioned this earlier to you, is, is are you buying in bulk? So if you've got, if you're buying from an investment perspective and you've got a whole lot of people that are in the same space as you're looking to invest, you identify a good complex, maybe you're going to approach a developer and buy 5, 10, 15, 20 units in a complex, you'll most certainly get a discount. The other side of it is that, um, developers will use two things that'll, that, that'll say, well, I don't need to give you a discount because we're paying your transfer fees for you. That's normally negotiated with the development attorney, and that, that's given it an absolute steal for them because the development attorney is getting uh, a bulk supply. And then part two is that you're not paying transfer duty. But remember, if you are generally buying into complex, and let's talk about saying again, you're generally buying below the million rand mark, which means there's no transfer duty applicable anyway, but you are paying that um, within that purchase price, which is then financed. So it is something just to keep in mind that, that um, you know, uh, the sales engines in particular, again, are, are trained to try and drive value towards you in terms of you, you need to pay a million rand for this, this unit. Whereas if you bide your time and you, and you play the game right, you do your research correctly, you could potentially negotiate slightly better deals, particularly now we spoke about it earlier in this market, you know, a lockdown and post lockdown market is gonna be an absolute buyer's market. And that's so correct, uh, you know, Grant, a number of different guests that we've had right here on the Private Property Podcast have actually said that even pre-COVID, we already saw that it's a buyer's market, but now more than ever, you've seen interest rate cuts, we've seen the effects that COVID has had, um, you know, not just in the property market, but in the, the economy and not only in South Africa, but really at a global scale. So the next few years, probably the next three to five years, with obviously the first kind of 24 months, 
being a really big buyer's market. So if people do have the opportunity to take advantage of approaching the developer that they want to buy from, this is probably the, the opportunity for them to, to negotiate that lower price. We are, of course, taking more of your questions at home around buying into a new development. Another question coming in, Grant, this one from Stephanie Vitboy, who asks, I've gone, to, I've gone to a few developments and noticed the unit prices differ from agent to agent. How does one find the best price? So the first thing is to be careful um, once you engage one agent, that agent essentially is linked to you in terms of the, the, the purchase process. So, um, you know, again, I would, if I've found a cheaper price to another agent, I'd li literally approach the agent that I've, I've um, uh, been dealing with and said, well, it's on the market at 100,000, uh, know, 50,000 and cheaper through this agent. Um, I, I needed of that price. So um, you can, don't know, a lot of developments have their own sales teams. They don't have agents on it. They've got their own sales teams. So again, it's about a negotiation there. So again, um, I think the, the point here, and, and, and you've done that correctly, is research. You know, don't just blindly arrive at a, a complex, uh, walk around and, and accept what, what is given to you, is do your research, um, jump online, there's plenty of information, private property marketing, I mean, you can go and, and search areas and find comparables and prices um, quite easily um, using the platform. So, so yeah, I mean, just do your research is, is vitally important. And uh, we've got a comment here from one of our regulars, Bruno Santos, who, are, who says, I've noticed properties are built too quickly and poorly developed uh, compared to the older ones from about 15 years ago. So I think that's one of the reasons why they give you free levies for a year. Yeah. Would you say so, that? I mean, yeah, so I mean, there's two things here. I mean, the free levies for a year, I think, yeah, I'm very, very cautious on that. Um, developers are offering it, but in, in fact, it's not their right to, to offer because you've got your section title scheme registered, which needs to be registered post uh, the development once the occupation certificates are given out. And then your, your body corporate is then convened and then they make a decision on your levy. So the developers are, are offering something that to be fair, it, as in my perspective, I understand to be corrected, is not their right to be giving anyway. Um, you know, because you, what you're doing is once they convene that body corporate or that section of title body, you're going to tell them, well, by the way, I bought with no levies. So who in that complex is going to pay levies? And who's going to, to be fair, Pay for your your um, your PQ your your participation quotient um, of your fees. So somebody needs to pay that at the end of the day. So it's going to come somewhere. And if they've given the entire complex free levies, you know where example don't you'll have to raise especially. So I do have an issue a little bit with that. I do agree um, with certain developers that they are putting up stuff very very quickly. They are cutting corners and cutting costs. And I think it's because People go into developers without fully understanding the space and then they, they make assumptions and, and they think it's a hugely profitable area and they don't really do their research in terms of pricing, uh, labor costs, um, building costs, holding costs, and then they start cutting corners. So they've got to get stuff up quicker and then they've got to cut corners in terms of quality. So I do agree uh, that there is some stuff going up very, very quickly. Um, but exactly, you know, we use Baldwin as an example. Baldwin have had some issues in the past, but they build far faster than anybody else on that. But they've got a templated uh, model where they 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 can literally all sorts of uh, they play leg on a big scale to be fair so they can build very quickly at, with the right quality so again i think it's about researching the developer making sure that the, what they've built in the past hasn't caused issues um and then going into development maybe getting a property inspector in um, we, i spoke about a property inspector before but you know getting a property inspector in who know the little signs to look for uh, uh, mm -hmm. them for proof uh, coursing as an example, needs to protrude from the wall. They'll look for that and make sure it's there. And I think um, another question coming in here, this time from Kalani Kiamu asks, what information do I need to get if I'm a first time investor in a new development? Is there some sort of a document that someone needs to get and read before buying into a new development? So the, so the problem there, I said, like I said, is the, the, the section title scheme or the section title register is only registered after the fact and then, uh, or, or is registered and then, and then um, the units are sold and then all the, um, uh, the body corporate is convened. So the decision on the levies is then made. So a few things, are they, and what the developers do, they normally do an estimate on levies. Now, to their benefits, to minimize that estimate as much as possible, so it doesn't seem like it's that, that as expensive to, to live there because levies is, is, is the biggest expense that's overlooked when people buy in section title. So firstly, I'll look at not only um, what they, they, their budgeted levy is, but what are the elements that make up that budget? And I'll do the, a comparison to maybe a next door 
uh, next door complex, go and find out from next door complex person, what are your levies compared to this? What are the amenities you offer compared to the complex I'm looking at? To try and understand that if that budget is realistic, you'll often find that that number is very, very low. So levies is the very first thing that I'd, I would um, question. Um, in terms of documentation from, from the, the, the um, uh, sales agent, you, you're really going to get the, the, the plans and what is planned and, and what's going to proceed, the agreements and then the financial or the projected financials. So there's not a lot you can get from them, particularly when it's off plan um, from, that, from, that, uh, from that point of view. And I think, you know, one of the things that we do underestimate, as you were saying, is the cost of levies. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, people don't realize just how um, high that particular cost can be. Um, in some instances, you know, a special levy can be raised fairly early on um, once, you know, you've taken the occupation. So perhaps another way to go about it is in the event where that same developer has built a similar um, you know, complex or estate to find out of those, you know, particular estate or complex, what are the levies looking like? Because you tend to find that in some of them, the levy structure is relatively similar um, because what they're offering in those particular, you know, complexes or estates is relatively the same. So it also does give you, um, you know, a, a good estimate of how much it might potentially be. Grant, before I let you go, any other tips for our viewers at home who are looking into buying into a new development? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, uh, the reason you're buying in, um, if you're buying in for investments, I'd, I'd be very, very cautious unless you're getting a substantial deal. Um, I'd potentially look at secondhand stock or, or uh, other stock that's on the market already built. If you're looking to buy a home, you know, again, the reason you're buying, uh, you know, take a look at that. But the big thing that I think, again, is overlooked, like I said, is a levy cost. And people buy into complexes because these all these amenities, gyms are offered, swimming pools, tennis courts, um, um, clubhouses, everything else. All of that, those costs need to be carried by somebody. So if you're going to a, a, a medium-sized complex, that can be very, very expensive. And you can sit with a levy that's two and a half, three and a half thousand rand a month, which actually is, is a large chunk of what your mortgage would be. So you might want to start looking if for a first-time home buyer, looking at a complex with fewer amenities, lower levy costs, so you can actually afford a bigger property and, and pay less towards your, your common area um, usage. So I think that's the biggest thing for me, particularly the new developments. Thank you so much, Grant. So I think to our viewers at home, if you are looking into buying into a new property, there's quite a bit of research that you must do from understanding, you know, whether or not the developer who's building has done this before, uh, you know, researching about their track record, researching whether they have processes in dealing with the post-sale snags that might come up into that particular development, and really being sure that you trust that particular developer, but also understanding what happens after the fact. So, you know, what are your levies going to be looking like? Are you sure about the estimate um, of those particular levies? Are you sure that you'll still be able to afford that place post, um, you know, having bought that particular establishment? And really the big thing that Grant has emphasized is the importance of making sure that you double check and research. And you can, of course, do that right here on privateproperty.co.za, where we give you various tips on how to go about navigating, dealing with developers um, on your home ownership journey. Grant, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I've been speaking to Grant Smear, who's a director at Epic South Africa. And we've been looking at some of the things or questions that you should be looking out for and asking when buying into a new development. We're, of course, back again tomorrow evening, looking at another issue uh, that is affecting a lot of us. And of course, if you're on your property journey, you don't want to miss that one. Until tomorrow, we'll be back. Good evening. I hope you're staying home and staying safe. And we'll be back again tomorrow.